With the loss of national celebrity William Perry, 1985 All-Pro punter Dale Hatcher, four other 1985 NFL rookies, and a total of 27 seniors who were 37, 6, and 2 in four years. 1985 was supposed to be a dark season in Death Valley. Opposing ACC coaches could finally take a breath when playing Clemson, according to many of the preseason prognosticators. Many of the so-called experts thought Danny Ford's team would be lucky to gain four wins against a schedule that included six teams that had been to bowl games in 1984. Starting 17 underclassmen most of the season, the 1985 Tigers surprised the odds makers and laid the groundwork for the future without skipping a beat. Thompson had reloaded on the move and gained an ACC record ninth straight winning regular season and advanced to the school's 12th postseason bowl appearance. Danny Ford, America's seventh winningest active coach, proved once again why he is one of America's top mentors as he molded a group of young, aggressive athletes into a team that could win via the pass, the run, the sack, or the special teams. It was not Clemson's winningest team in history, but it might have been the most exciting campaign in terms of nail biters as seven contests were decided by a touchdown or less. The experience gained in these close games might be looked upon as the important stepping stones to the future. Just as the 1981 national champions were built off the experience gained in the 1980-65 season, the success of teams in the latter half of the 80s might look back at the foundations planted in this 1985 season. For the third time in 16 years, Clemson opened the season on the road, this time in Blacksburg, Virginia, against Virginia Tech. The Tigers wanted to show all concerned that they would be a sharp, balanced offensive team in 1985. And sophomore quarterback Randy Anderson began the season with a pass completion to 1984 All-ACC wide receiver Terrence Rulock. Defense dominated the first three quarters as the two teams combined for just 13 points. Steve Berlin had a great opener with seven tackles, including this sack of Mark Cox for a nine-yard loss. Henry Walls, who led Clemson in tackles in 1985 with 153, had a timely interception in the first half. Clemson trailed 10-3 entering the fourth period when the offense got into high gear. After a Kenny Flowers touchdown tied the score, Randy Anderson and Ray Williams showed their respective athletic abilities. In the longest play of the season in terms of clock time, Anderson avoided the rush and hit the intelligent Williams, who came back for the pass. Three breakdance moves later, the Tigers had a 46-yard touchdown and a 17-10 lead. But the Gobblers came back to tie the count on a touchdown of their own with 5.48 left on this touchdown pass. Anderson now had 2.39 left to get Clemson a winning score, and he used all of it. The key play of this drive was this pass completion to tailback Stacy Driver, who accounted for over 100 yards in total performance for the day. The 41-yard completion put Clemson in great shape. With no time left on the clock, David Treadwell, who had never kicked a field goal in a football game at any level prior to this day, booted the winning 36-yard field goal to give Clemson a heart-stopping 20-17 win. That boot touched off quite a celebration for the young Tiger team as Clemson won its 34th straight over a Division I team from Virginia. Clemson might have been looking ahead of Virginia Tech to the Georgia game. The interstate rivalry would have been enough to get anyone excited. But the inaugural appearance of a Clemson home game on national television and CBS TV's accompanying personalities made it very special. Brent Musburger and Dara Parsegan were marshals in the first Friday parade and gave a rousing speech at one of the most active pep rallies in Clemson's spirited history. The Tigers carried over the spirit to Saturday afternoon in the first quarter. On Clemson's second possession, the 6'5 Anderson hit 6'5 tight end Jim Riggs with this pass over the middle, and the rugged receiver Ramboed the rest of the real estate for a touchdown. Place kicker David Treadwell booted a pair of field goals, proving his heroics of the previous week were no fluke. Defenses dominated until the final period for a second week in a row. Here, Henry Walls, who had 18 tackles in the game, picked off the sixth interception of his career. But Georgia quarterback James Jackson was too slippery in the fourth quarter for the Tigers as he scored on this 11-yard run and led the Bulldogs to 360 yards rushing. 
As has been the case in the last few seasons, Georgia scored its winning points on an unusual play as center Pete Anderson recovered a fumble to give the Bulldogs the lead for good. Consecutive losses to Georgia Tech and Kentucky followed the defeat at the hands of the Bulldogs. The Yellow Jackets used a strong defense to hold Clemson to only 101 yards rushing as the Tigers failed to score a touchdown for the first time in 69 games. While the offense was sputtering in the two early season losses, the defense was playing sound football. Georgia Tech did not gain 100 yards in the air and had only two drives of 60 yards or more the entire afternoon. Freshman Rodney Curtis had nine tackles in 21 plays of action. Ray Williams was a highlight in the Kentucky loss, as he accounted for over 100 yards in total performance, including this 25-yard touchdown run, his third straight rushing TD in three carries over two seasons. For the first time in many years, and maybe in the history of the series, Virginia was favored against Clemson. The Wahoos were coming off a bowl bid season, and George Welsh had resurrected the program. Clemson needed a transfusion of sorts, and Danny Ford provided it with a return to the basics of Clemson power football. Rodney Williams moved into the starting quarterback position, and the Tigers returned to the option run-oriented attack that had led Clemson to 37 wins and a national championship between 1981 and 1984. Stacy Driver and Kenny Flowers both went over 100 yards on this pleasant homecoming afternoon. Later in the quarter, Williams mixed up the Wahoos and hit freshman Keith Jennings over the middle for 19 yards. Three plays later, it was time for old reliable, the reverse, this time to Terrence Ruan. The junior wide receiver raced 26 yards for a score. Clemson was in the top 10 in the nation in pass defense entering the game. Delton Hall and Perry Williams showed why on these plays. They were the top two players in the ACC in terms of pass deflections in 1985. Clemson took the lead nine minutes into the third period on another innovative play that took advantage of the versatility of Clemson's receiver twins. Ray Williams, a former high school quarterback, took the pitch from Rodney Williams and eluded two Virginia defenders. Then threw a strike to Rulock in the corner of the end zone for a 29-yard touchdown. It was the first pass completion for a Clemson wide receiver since 1941. But Virginia came right back to take the lead 24-20 with 40 seconds to go in the third quarter on a one-yard run by Kevin Morgan. Now, most young teams, depressed by three-game losing streaks, would have folded to this juncture. But Kenny Flowers and the Tiger offense moved 85 yards on the next possession. The big play, another Williams to Williams play as this bomb of 51 yards set up a Flowers touchdown. The 27-24 victory was pivotal for the Tigers. It kept the nation's longest winning streak of one opponent over another alive at 25 games. But more importantly, it proved to this young Clemson team that it could be a fine team. It was the turning point of the season. Danny Ford didn't get a lot of sleep the week of the Duke game. Pre-game preparation was put on the back burner as Daniel Lee Ford II was born on October 17th. The birth put everyone in a good frame of mind, especially Kenny Flowers. The six-foot tailback with roadrunner speed had his third straight 100-yard day against Steve Sloan's team. That's a first in Clemson Annals. Flowers gained over 100 yards in the first period alone and gave Clemson an early but insurmountable lead. He scored a pair of touchdowns before the first period was over on long classic runs. Terrence Flagler, who saw considerably more action due to a back injury to Stacy Driver, had his best game of the season with 79 yards, 27 on this nifty touchdown run. The run gave Clemson 21 points, 19 minutes into the contest. In a game that was like a baseball doubleheader, the Tiger defense won the second game of the twin bill. The Berlin Wall, an all-ACC Titan in 1985, forced a key fumble early in the game. And Henry Walls, who was involved in seven Clemson turnovers in 1985, picked up the loose ball to stop a Duke drive. Middle guard Pat McKenney had a big sack in the fourth period, the first of his career. 
two fifth-year seniors showed Clemson's diaper defense how it's done on this play. Kenny Danforth and Eldridge Milton combined to keep the Duke offense out of the end zone with six minutes left in the fourth period. It was another shutout for the Tigers in the fourth period, and the normally high-powered Duke offense was held without a touchdown for the day as Clemson won its fifth straight over the Blue Devils, 21-9. When the season began, most experts felt the only bowl game Clemson would play in was the Textile Bowl. A victory over NC State put the Tigers back in the postseason bowl picture, an unheard of vision three weeks previously. Clemson would play nearly flawless ball on this afternoon. There were eight sacks as Danny Ford's defense went through State's offensive line as if it were not even there. It was a sack of sacks for the defensive line, led by Mark Drag's two quarterback stops behind the line. Keith Williams, Michael Dean Perry, and Ty Granger combined for this stop in the first half. Perry, injured much of the first six weeks, was 100% for this battle, and he had nine tackles on the day. There were also four interceptions by the Clemson defense, another season high, including this theft by Brian Raber. It was the first interception by a Clemson lineman since the 1978 Gator Bowl. Offensively, Kenny Flowers registered a point total that would have made any Clemson basketball player happy as he had three scores for the day. The Clemson ground attack picked up 279 yards, 125 by the ricochet rabbit, Stacy Driver. Clemson's three tailbacks combined for 250 yards as NC State became Clemson's third straight victim 39 to 10. The Wake Forest game got off to a black start, as black as Demon Deacon uniforms. The heart of the Clemson defensive line, Steve Berlin, who was on a record pace in terms of tackles per game, was injured on the first snap of the game and lost for the season. His departure rallied the Clemson motivation forces as others took it upon themselves to take up the slack. Here, Michael Dean Perry threw Michael Ramsur for an early loss. Then he combined with Berlin's replacement, Raymond Chavis, on this play. Offensively, Clemson controlled the scrimmage line as if they were living by the motto, 54, 40, or fight. Steve Reese had 11 knockdown blocks in the game and helped Kenny Flowers bloom on this 52-yard touchdown run in the second period. Rodney Williams had his best day of the year in terms of total offense as he completed 10 areas. He hit Terrence Rulock for a 15-yard touchdown to close out Clemson's scoring. But in the end, it was the Clemson defense once again that made the big plays. Terrence Mack, Clemson's banded end, who had 11 tackles in the game, broke through and nailed Daryl McGill for a four-yard loss. He combined with Henry Walls to force another turnover. As Clemson made it nine in a row, over Wake Forest. Clemson entered the North Carolina game with a four-game winning streak in 1985 and a 19-game winning streak over four years against big four schools from the Northern State. It appeared that the streak would continue as the Tigers continued to move the ball with ease. Kenny Flowers scored to put Clemson up 10-7 in the third period. It was the fifth straight game in which the 1986 Heisman Trophy candidate had scored a touchdown. Stacy Driver might have thrown more halfback option passes than any other Clemson running back in the last 25 years. And he showed why Danny Ford had so much confidence in him on this 57-yard TD pass to Terrence Rulock. But the Tar Heels had a passing game of their own and erased Clemson's 17-7 fourth quarter lead. This pass was ruled a completion with less than a minute left. And when Willie Hume scored with just 10 seconds showing on the clock, North Carolina had a 21 to 20 victory. It's first over the Tigers in Chapel Hill since 1971. CBS was back in town for the November 16th showdown with Maryland, a game that would decide Clemson's ACC championship fate. Early in the week, Danny Ford had studied film that showed a weakness in the Maryland punting game. 
freshman Donnell Wolford watched the same film and broke through to block this Maryland punt in the first period. After a Terrence Mack assist, Perry Williams retrieved the ball and ran 30 yards for a score. Another block punt led to a Clemson touchdown as Gene Beasley, a strong safety destined for a starting assignment in 1986, deflected this boot. It led to Stacy Driver's 11-yard touchdown run just before the half. The excitement continued in the second half. Clemson regained the lead with 5.53 to go in the fourth period on freshman fullback Tracy Johnson's run behind Jeff Litton, Wes Mann, and John Watson, giving Clemson a 31-24 lead. But Maryland scored 10 points in the final two minutes, seven on this questionable reception by Keith Edmonds. A Dan Plocky 20-yard field goal with three seconds left gave Clemson its second straight loss in the last 10 seconds, 34-31. Clemson and South Carolina entered the season finale with quite a bit at stake. And this was already a contest that needed no extra motivational factors. Both teams were 5-5, so a winning regular season was on the line. And the folks from the Independence Bowl had a bid in hand waiting the victor. Randy Anderson gave the Tigers a spark as a reserve in the first scoring drive as he hit Rulock for 15 yards. The play led to a David Treadwell field goal. But South Carolina took control 14 to three in the second period behind two Kent Haygood touchdowns. Just before halftime, Kenny Flowers scored his 12th TD of the season to bring Clemson within two. The Tigers then went for two, and Terrence Flagler was the recipient of the two-point play in one of the game's bigger moments. Danny Ford has always stated that the first drive of the third quarter is the most important, and he proved to be a soothsayer on this day. This A.J. Johnson recovery after a Keith Williams hit on South Carolina's first play of the third quarter brought old momentum back to Clemson's side of the field. Johnson and Williams had 13 tackles apiece for the day. Flowers, Clemson's fourth 1,000-yard rusher for a single season, then powered his way into the end zone, and Clemson had a 21-14 advantage. South Carolina came right back, however, with a drive of its own to the Clemson 20. On a second and two play, Anthony Smith took a handoff and was stripped of the ball by ever-improving Brian Raven. The Tigers added another Treadwell field goal, his 15th of the season with eight minutes left. Holding a seven-point lead, it was now up to the defense. Finally, with 30 seconds to play, Raymond Chavis, Clemson's defensive MVP of the game, pulled down Mike Hold for a five-yard loss. The clock ran out on the Gamecocks, who never could get into the Clemson end zone in the second half. The Tigers celebrated their 12th triumph in the last 15 years over the Gamecocks and their ninth straight winning regular season and ACC record. It was on to Shreveport and a bowl bid for a team that was supposed to undergo a reconstruction year. Despite the narrow loss to Minnesota in the Independence Bowl, an aura of optimism surrounds the Clemson football program in 1986. 49 of the 57 players who participated in the Independence Bowl and 18 of the 22 starters will return in 1986. Additionally, players who accounted for 85% of the reception yardage and over 65% of the rushing yardage for a team that was 13th in the nation in rushing return for 1986. On defense, 10 of the 11 starters from the bowl game and eight of the top nine tacklers for the season also are back. Some of Clemson's top players of the last decade will return to spearhead Clemson's title drive. Defensive ends Terrence Mack and Michael Dean Perry are also all-star candidates, while 1985 honorable mention All-American A.J. Johnson, who broke Terry Kennard's Clemson record for tackles by a secondary player, also returns. Offensively, Clemson's entire receiving and quarterbacking combinations are back. Rodney Williams set a Clemson freshman passing record in 1985, while Ray Williams and Terrence Rulak 
are both in the top 10 in Clemson history in reception yards and receptions. All ACC tight end Jim Riggs will be back to key the offensive line. And place kicker David Treadwell will be the top returning kick scorer in the conference. Standing above the crowd of returnees at Clemson, in the ACC, and possibly nationally, will be 1986 Heisman Trophy candidate Kenny Flowers. His list of accomplishments is indeed impressive. Flowers set a Clemson single season rushing record in 1985 with 1,200 yards. He led the Atlantic Coast Conference in touchdowns with 13, led the ACC in scoring with 78 points, set a Clemson record for 100-yard games with seven. And Kenny Flowers is already fourth in career rushing with 2,319 yards. The list goes on and on, and hopefully in 1986, the list will go on and on again as Clemson fans watch with interest as Flowers strives to bring the Heisman and an ACC championship back to Clemson. Well,